before we are starting about mythology, I would just pose again the question you raised it in our first email contact when I was telling you that I'm replacing you, that you said you have an unease feeling this. Having two whiteies anthropologists or researchers from the global north who are discussing the topic of decolonizing without having anyone in having anyone who is a uh, who's from the global south on the table. Mm. I don't well, well it's 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 one aspect. Uh the, the Maybe we should start by by saying what we mean by decolonizing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a term I, I would I, I don't really use in a kind of Walter Mignolo way. Decolonize, I would prefer because it means that that there's a, a colonization that you can undo it or, or cut yourself away from it, uh, which I don't think is the case. Uh, so I'd rather stick to the post-colonial in the sense that the post incorporates the past and, 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 and takes that uh, with it. Um, and also decolonizing research, it presupposes that what I do or what we do or you do is, is, is colonizing in a way. And, uh, and that is not necessarily true, of course. There is the fact and that perhaps my, my first, I mean the first remark when we emailed each other about it, uh, um, the fact that a girl from Berlin and a boy from Belgium sit here to de discuss decolonizing research uh, is of course not meaningless, uh, I don't think. Uh, and so there's a whole thing about uh, knowledge production and, and if you look around in the room, I mean most of the people sitting here are not from uh, the, 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 the places that we talk about. Uh, and and uh, and so on. So there's that. Uh, there's there's economically, politically, all all of that. But I don't. I don't. Um, when I would think about that issue of colonizing, decolonizing, and so on, I would I would put it elsewhere. I would I would say, <coughs> you know, it's about. Um, it's a for me personally, of course, and there's also a personal history. I'm Belgian. You you work. You, we we share a Congo experience. I don't know, and I'm going to ask you later on why why it is you ended up with Congo. Uh, for me, it also comes from a colonial history. As a Belgian, it was almost I mean uh, yeah, it was almost pre-written that I would I would go to. I wanted to work in Indonesia to yes, start. You said you didn't want to travel. Hmm? You, you said you didn't want to, to work in Congo. No, certainly not, because it, it had too much past and too much uh, too much history to it. So, uh, but then, given the academic uh, uh, sphere of, uh, I ended up in Congo anyway, uh, and I'd never before given it any thought. It was certainly not my. So it's totally by accident in a way. But I've always thought I'm, you know, you know and being Belgian in Congo, of course, even today means something. What does uh, it in, mean? in those huh? But what does it mean but in concrete? It it gives you a shared past. It gives you the, there's a history there. So it 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 comes with 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 a certain luggage, uh, positive luggage or negative. Or it's not it's not neutral. Uh, it's not like being German in Congo. I I would imagine. Uh, uh, and uh, but so I I thought well, I I don't have a I don't have a, a history a family history with Congo. I don't have a. I didn't have a personal past. Uh, mm -hmm. I was born in 1961 after independence, so I, I, I consider myself a post-colonial subject in, in, in the same way that the Congolese people I, I deal with uh, are post-colonial. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, and, and I, I think that re research, doing research, uh, what does it involve? It involves actually yeah, finding a place and so on, but but what is your position? You know, you're, you're saying, okay, you're coming from Belgium, you're going and doing research in Congo, but how are you positioning yourself inside? Because you, it's not neutral, you said. N no, but it, it also gives you a starting point. I mean, mm. it's uh, maybe I, I, I started doing research in Congo in 1986, uh, so it's, it's been a while. Uh, and. Uh, and so the thing is, uh, yeah, to, to, to hear the place, but to, I, I think what is very important is, is uh, maybe I come from a generation, why I wanted to become an anthropologist is, is maybe the question. It was mm -hmm. certainly still in search of an alternative world to the world I, was, I grew up in. <coughs> and, and that's certainly what, what pushed me to an, an, an elsewhere. Uh, I think by now I, I've, I've come full circle and, and back home in, in the early, 
I spent two years in a, in a, in a village on the, the Congo-Angola border uh, with a very romantic idea of what anthropology would be or what it had to be, and uh, being Congolese amongst Congolese and so on. Of course, it's uh, insanity. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't exist. And so I, I've, I've, I've come uh, full circle to that. I'm, I'm, I moved back to Belgium. I have a life there and so on. And and uh, and what what interests me much more today is not the, the, an alternative, not the difference, but what what ties us together. And and so it's about uh, a human encounter. It's about other people, uh, and and uh, that I can deal with on 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 a, a human level and intersubjective level. And and I and I I I want to I want to be part of that of that encounter, and I want to to talk about it as as well as I can. So I think for me decolonizing means how can you invent a language mm. to talk about that encounter or to, to describe the reality that you yourself are inevitably also part of. But if you're and talking about the language, I would come back to the encounter itself. How does it how do you encounter your, your research field? How do you deal with the people you are writing about it? How, how do you deal with them? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you first. <laughs> I, I was asking you. Yeah. <laughs> so, like no, no, I deal I'm with, just, like I deal with people here. People are people. No, because everywhere. you were saying to me before, you you you're already living in Congo and you're living in Belgium. You're going back and forth, and um, I was just like, is it just like you're living there and you're observing, or? Mm. But well, over over time, of course, the the the, the, the issues change. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's not about finding a place. I I do have a life. I do have friends. I do have a social yeah. uh, life, or in in, in 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 Congo, and and part of that spills over to my life in Belgium, and vice versa. So there's there's not much of a uh, a lot of the people also live global lives and, and, and move between places and, and move between Brussels and Kinshasa, for example. So th that difference is, is, is no longer there. And with time, last time there was uh, Vergara here, the photographer, mm. uh, who, who speaks about his methodology of re-photography and mm. revisiting the same places. And it's true that I, I think it's very, that's why I would never work anywhere else. Over time, you grow with a place and you, you also acquire uh, a, a position in that place. Friends, people I dislike, uh, the all kinds of situations. And, and the question of acquiring a place doesn't pose itself. Uh, it's, it's not something that I think about today. Mm. Uh, no, well, but let's tell you, take it about, like you, um, I saw last time that you, you you document here in cemetery state, you know, and you you know we have all this protagonist, and you were you were talking about before, how how did you approach? What did they think about that you're doing a, a movie, uh, a document here about there? Uh, I I I don't know what they think about it, but uh, but how uh, did you um did you negotiate with them? How did they accept to to have you making a movie on on their life on the cemetery? Well, before making a movie, of course, I, mean, I, I spent a lot of time with these people years before, mm -hmm. so it, it was not as if it just happened, it uh, came. But then, as, as it usually goes, I mean, people didn't really necessarily understand what that movie would be about. They thought it was going to be about the cemetery. It's only in the process that they started realizing it was also about themselves and about their own lives, which I think what they, they thought was a, a pleasant uh, discovery because all of a sudden it became also their project. And, and uh, I think in the end result, they were very happy to see, to see themselves on the screen. And, and, and so that's what I mean with, 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 uh, with language. Um, in this case, mm. uh, a language that I narratively or filmically uh, invent or, or, or I make I make a representation <laughs> which these people participate but but it's about it's about making lives and livelihoods visible that otherwise mm, people wouldn't necessarily know about or see I think the protagonists in that film were ha very happy to be seen it ga gave them a sense of pride also to participate in that so that was not the problem at all did they criticize uh, it hmm? did someone criticize it <coughs> You showed it to them, you said yes, you showed it afterward in a yes. private um, screening. Did someone criticize it or we were all kind of happy? B depending on the context, I mean, audience receptions are different everywhere. Yeah, uh, so whether I, depending on where I, when I show it in Congo, mm -hmm. when I show it in, in Brussels or here or in the States. So people, people uh, 
respond to it differently. The, the most negative reactions I got from African audiences outside of Congo, right? not European ones, not Congolese ones, but Nigerian ones, for example. <laughs> what did they say? Who, who were rather they were rather shocked by by the the, the way which funerals unfolded in the and said that this is not this can't be African and uh, we, uh, we we don't treat our dead dead like that and, and, and so on so so that that dep that depends uh, yeah the audience reception mm -hmm. but it's something that you, uh, that you I don't know whether you have to deal with that uh, necessarily it's uh, I try I try to be as true as I can to whatever it is I experience and want to talk about and I think very often, like in the film, it's not only my own questioning or my own <laughs> amazement or at how these things unfold or what that space means. It's also the city itself. And, and people talk about the way in which that is treated in, in, in that context. So, and, and, and it's, f it's, it's about finding a language together to express that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, before coming here, I, I, I was reading this book by Robert Hughes, the art critic, and the, the Shock of the New, it was a famous uh, BBC documentary series, and he writes about the First World War, uh, saying uh, during the First World War, the, the, the language was broken, it, it no longer could carry the meanings that, that the, to convey the world as it was, and, well and it language was all of a sudden became something, something else. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a situation like Kinshasa, not that it has gone through a war, but in a way, city life is, is also its own daily warfare in a way. And, and that city life, that urban life, changes experience and changes the language that, that goes with it. And so people are constantly in the process of making new languages for, the, for their actual experiences. And, and I, I think it's my role, um, if you talk about decolonizing, mm -hmm. of course, we write, you and I write, we film. All of these are colonizing tools. They, they order reality in a certain way and they impose a certain order onto whatever it is you encounter. But so the thing is to open that up and to, uh, to, to, to change that into something else or to capture something else that... that uh, and I think, I think it was Achille Bembe who said we, we, th we, 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 we tend to think about Africa in terms of an economic project or in terms of a political project and so on. But it's also important to think about it as an aesthetic project. Mm -hmm. And that aesthetic project involves precisely making a language for the, the kinds of reality that are there and that very often go unnoticed or that we don't have the tools for to, to talk about. I think a, a, lo a lot of the, the, the discourses, the paradigms that we apply to these concrete situations do not actually fit them. And, uh, and so uh, uh, against the colonizing tools of, of, of knowledge production of the colonial library, you can say, uh, of uh, you, you, you have to, to invent uh, another library that is much closer to. And so I, I think my, as an anthropologist, what we do is, is try to bridge that gap between theory and discourse and actual experience and, and, and to, to bring that together and to, to close that gap and you could say that that's a decolonizing effort then, uh, if you want to use that terminology. But mm. uh, but what about you? <laughs> <laughs> what about me? <laughs> what do you want to need? Oh no. Uh, so you you I I, I know you um, I, you're a, a sociologist of migrations, uh, working with Congolese diasporas also. But your first background was an activist background. Yes, my uh, first background is an activist background. Mm, so I was a squatter. And and was a it punk. because of that activism that you were? brought to that topic or, or it was the activism of course i was a punk i was living in germany in 92 and of course there's all this fascist attacks and what's happening in the politics it also it it it, it also was challenging us it was also confronted against us against this kind of mixed crowd we were and so we got involved i got involved with migration politics and you know right after 92, they changed the german asylum law and they introduced also the migration policies they um um, how to say it? They they stretch. They they made them st um, strict. They restricted them, and so I got involved with um, yeah, like there was a campaign. No one is illegal. It was, it was, it was founded in, I think it was 1997 on the documentary in Castle. We, we it was kind of founded, and I was documenting it for like seven, eight years. Different actions that we are doing. And we're starting to have no border camps, no border camps in Germany, no border camps at the borders of Europe, and then also going outside to Europe. And 
in this network, there were a lot of people who were also kind of doing research on migration or research on were anthropologists or whatever. And so we decided to, or we tried to, I don't know if we made it, just like to use research also as an activist tool. You know, you're going outside or you're, you're trying to look at all migration. You, uh, Let's tell it like, let's say it's like a new colonial new migration regime that's emerging here. And we're looking on it from inside and from outside. And we are trying to connect with people from outside who are researchers, who are activists, um, and trying to put different perspectives together and trying to also form another, another language on it. If you're talking about language, if you're talking as about aesthetics, what is predominantly still like in, in scientific way here in Europe that's the meaning, the feeling that it's kind of the victimization of the migrants, you know, we are all the poor people who want to come to to Europe on the one hand and on the other hand there's also this myth and this is also in the leftist and it's also in the science I would say is in that the in the science, science. In the science mm. that they think that the people, those people <laughs> from Sub-Saharan Africa or also from North Africa, or whatever, wants to come to Europe, and it's it's quite bullshit. Most mm. people, if they migrate, they also migrate to other places. They pray, they go to Asia, they go to, uh, to South America or to Canada, and or they they, they they remain or they go to another African country. But it's um, it was kind of a challenging thing, and we started to try to combine this. And I started to do research in in 2006 in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And it was more like a personal incident because I met someone which I knew from a friend who was on his travel. And so we, I started up and we met some activists. And yeah, since then we start to develop kind of a network. We have also people from Ukraine or whatever um, context to Toronto, United States, Latin America. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your you, you, your main drive was, or is still political in a way. It depends. Or, or it changes, of course. <laughs> and how did it change? Then? What changed? No, I would say my main drive is probably still political because you know um, I think it's as being a European, you know, um, talk living in this country here. Of course, you have to um, talk about these borders. You want to live in a democra democracy, but you cannot live in a democracy if you're closing your borders and if you have this kind of hierarchies inside. Mm -hmm. But um, of course, it changed. Like for Kobe Prayer, I was more focused on aesthetics. I was not on on religion. I was kind of. What about religion? Are you <laughs> driven to that subject at all? Or? Well, as I said before, I was a punk. I was raised very Catholic in a really feudal community. Catholic. Catholic, yes. Mm. And I left it all, and so it was a little bit bizarre for me, you know, coming back to religion, coming back to this point, and going to these churches, and especially talking about with prophets and all these miracles. And Do you find it difficult at all? I, 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 come, I have a Catholic background as well. I have 12 years of Jesuit school, but... Uh, not that it ever bothered me. <laughs> 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 well, it bothered me. I, I don't Probably like it helps. It helps. I don't have to like the church to like church music. So <laughs> no, the music was really perfect. Mm. That was not a problem. It was more like it. Of course, it strikes me because when yet someone is telling me yes, and I had this miracle, and I'm now a prophet, and uh, you know, of course, at first you are struck, but it also is, uh, you have to question yourself. What is your reality? Why, why do you think it's weird? Why do you believe that this kind of a thing you don't have to do? Uh, this is not real. Why, sorry. I, I don't why, why do you believe this is a thing which is not real? If someone tells me, uh, well, there was a miracle yesterday, and in the beginning I think, well, what is this? Um, I have to question myself. Why do I believe that there was no miracle? Mm. It's also kind of a westernizing myth of secularis secularization, mm -hmm. and um, and there's just the world we see. But, as you the world. Yeah. but somehow you're drawn to the topic, and uh, you, you you chose to work on it. Yes. For some reason, I guess. Uh, what is it? Then? The reason was like I, I I realized that these kind of churches are really kind of connecting points. They are connecting in different ways. They are connecting the network. They are also connecting um, um, people. Where there's also connection between religion and the the market and the daily life, and also um, 
it has really importance for a lot of people who are also in travel. You know, when I'm when I'm doing research, I do it like people are on the move, people are trying to go somewhere else, and they are in kind of precarious situations. And in this situation, um, the religion has. I think religion has every time has a role for them, but it has more than just um, belief. It's also kind of a community center. It's also kind of a connecting point. Mm -hmm. And it's also kind of an organizing structure for them. Because, you know, if you're arriving in Istanbul, the first thing is you're going to contact the pastor. To, to? to contact the pastor. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, in the church, you also get to know how you can journey on. And so why Congo then? Uh, why how Congo? did that happen? <laughs> it was not my choice. <laughs> <laughs> it was not at all my choice. It was more like, um, well, uh, I was I was asked to to write a proposal for it, and since um, it was about diaspora, it was more like um, how to say it, somehow to deal with with the project. Mm -hmm. It could have been whatever. Before before I never did something like I'm, I'm working on Congolese migrants, I'm working on this kind of migrants. Um, I just was working in a region, in an area, and uh, just exploring what I'm doing there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, yeah, you, you, you told me before this morning that, uh, for example, Lampedusa deeply uh, in touched you or... or uh, what do you think then? How, how do you relate that to, your, to what you're doing or... Does that oh. reactivate the activist or...? I know, it's more frustrating. Hmm? It's to be honest, it's more frustrating. I know the things are happening in Lampedusa, but what is happening, they are fortifying the European migration policy. So it's kind of, you know, you, you feel like you're kind of, you're frustrated. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not say it's kind of activating my, me myself at the moment. Mm -hmm. So you feel a, a feeling of, of powerlessness with the... You Yes, I would say at the moment I feel like a power. I don't know, you know, everything changes and well, let's see what's happening in the next 10 years and I, d I don't know if it can go on like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, uh, that's rather <laughs> depressing. <laughs> By talking about this, you know, we are talking about decolonizing research, not about the European migration politics. Um, it is a, it is a, it, it's really. We can also talk about the problems, and I feel I have, I have, a, I have problems in the research field. I encounter problems, and one of the most striking thing is that um, when I'm introducing, uh, when I'm asking people to do an interview with me, you know, it's whether it's in Morocco or it's in, in Rio de Janeiro or it, it's in Istanbul. Istanbul, I know the best. You know, first of all, I have a European passport. Mm -hmm. And most of them, ha they don't have. So I, I meet them in a certain situation where they are kind of vulnerable. And, you know, I can just buy a, buy a ticket, which is 300 euros. When they are joining on, they have to pay much, much, much more. It's much expensive and they take high risks. So, of course, we already have an, a hierarchy, an hierarchy in the situation where we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And that creates also other information. I don't know how it is for you. But people are telling, you know, that they are also by first is every time, why should I tell you anything about me? What is the interest and what is my output? And what is my, what is, what is, what are you giving me back to me? Why should I do it? What is, and can I trust you? And what do you, what do you say then? Well. <laughs> how do you, how do you create a position for yourself? Where you can be a listener, let's say, and so that people well, let's say we can. I can start with global prayers. When I was starting it here in Berlin, it was really hard. I had a, I had one in one hour interview with them. It was more like a job interview. They were really just like I was sitting there, and they were asking me, "What is your? What are you doing? Why are you here?" And then I had to <laughs> show them my I work. I don't want to remind me of your job <laughs> interview. <but> no, <laughs> no, I'm talking about the pi the pastors. I'm not talking oh, the about pastor. no, not, no, not about the global. No, prayer. no, I'm talking about the pastors. No, <laughs> global prayer wasn't a job interview. No, it was much more, and and you know. I t but I'm telling them I'm an activist and I'm a researcher, and mm. I cannot promise them, but I'm. Um, what happens is often it's kind of a knowledge transfer. They tell me, okay, I tell you a story, but am I coming to Germany or I'm coming to Europe? Can I call you and can you give me some knowledge about lawyers or networks, which you know in your network? So it's more like a knowledge exchange. Mm -hmm. On a very practical level. 
on a very practical level. But on the other hand, of course, it's a p of course you have also like you have also scientists, you have also people who are researchers who are on the move, mm -hmm. and then you can also kind of collaborate. It also uh, encounters, and they are just reading your text, and they say no. I think you should. I, I, I should command on you that. Mm -hmm. I have to think about that also. Uh, but how are you? Are you? How are you reporting back to the community your your research? Like you said, your your movie you were showing them, but if you're writing a text, are you reporting it back? Uh, well, on, on on a certain level, yes. For example, I I I wrote a book on Kinshasa, mm -hmm. and I made sure, and I try to do that with most of my work that it's at least translated into French, mm -hmm. so that it's at some level available I mean, to a Congolese audience, even though that I mean, in reality perhaps doesn't mean a lot of things. That book costs forty euros, and that's a lot of money for most people. So, and even if they would buy the book. Mm. Then it's not it's it's not necessarily the case that that they would find it easy to understand it or read it or they, it's certainly not. So there's always that question. I'm, uh, it's it's a, it's a difficult question. Uh, um, a couple of years ago, I was teaching it at the University of Kinshasa, and uh, for a group of um, of of, of uh, really PhD students, uh, assistants, assistant professors, and so on. So not undergraduates it was a, a group of of, of uh, I also a bit older people and we were doing a kind of anthropological analysis of Pentecostal churches in Kinshasa and during the break after after one hour there was a short break and the whole group goes to sit in the corner of a room of the the, mm -hmm. the room the teaching room and they all start to pray after the break they come back and I asked them what did you pray for and uh, they said, well, we pray to get the evil words that you're p out of you, uh, that you, you're, you're pronouncing, because God doesn't want us to talk about religion in that way, in the way you do. And so for me, that was a real shock, uh, because I, I still had 15 more hours to go. And I thought, well, you know, that we absolutely... So we're going to pray no every day for you. There's <laughs> no common ground here. There, there's nothing. We don't have a shared vocabulary, so... Uh, so we uh, we discussed it for almost two hours. I remember saying, "Okay, I mean, there's nothing wrong with praying. Mm. Uh, far from that. But if you place yourself in this context, which is a university mm. academic context and so on, we, you, it also comes with its own conventions and its own discourse and so on. So we place ourselves in a different frame. And if you are not, I mean, you yourself, out of your own accord, place yourself in that frame, and that's how it goes here." Uh, and if we can't do that, then the we, we can absolutely not uh, I mean share. Uh, we, we the there's no language in common between us and we won't. So th that problem is there all the time, not only in what I produce academically, but just in, in, in daily encounters. And I think uh, and on a, a, a lot of levels uh, in terms of colonizing or a colonizing uh, text, I think there are far more colonizing uh, dynamics going on. <laughs> In 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 Congolese society, than than my own colonizing moves, if you if you want to define them that way. Mm. So uh, I I don't think uh, the, the importance is there. Uh, I think Pentecostal discourses are far more colonizing in many ways than than w whatever it is anthropology could probably uh, impose on. Why on do that you think is Pentecostalism uh, colonizing? Sorry. Why is it colonizing? You think? Well, I think it, it, it really comes, and there's again, there's nothing, as far as I'm concerned, nothing wrong with it. Uh, uh, it's just the way it is. It, it, but it, it, it really promotes, of course, as we all know, a certain kind of, of insertion into, into a more global world with, a, with, a, with its own ideologies of, of modernity, of, of a whole new subject formation, uh, a new kind of individual. It has interfered in, 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 in the past 20 years in far deeper ways than uh, uh, in, in, in what, for example, kinship means and, and how it restructures and mm. redefines the landscape of kinship. And, and, and what it does to families. And so far more, I think, and, and far better than 50 years of Catholic and Protestant uh, uh, missionization uh, uh, before. So in that, in that sense, uh, there's, a, there's a, a deeply colonizing move in it, but one that is, is auto-generated and that is, that is wanted. And, mm -hmm. and uh, even though I can, I, I, I can see what it does to that society or the, the kind of problems and, and, and that it creates also, but then, uh, uh, 
uh, it, it's not up to me to to like it or dislike it. I, I no, don't no, get no. It. Definitely, but just like when you're talking to pastors or talking to religious people or to the Pentecostal people, which I did interviews with, when I was asking them, they are turning it around. They say it, it's a decolon, it's a, it's a turn around because the, the Catholics they colonized us and we freed us from them. So it's that was the answer I accounted really often when I was af uh, answering why you're going now to this Pentecostal or to this revival church, and they said yes because we had been this kind of colonizing Catholic missions mm -hmm. in or the Belgian evangelical missions, and now we are taking our religion back to them. But in that but they're, yeah. they're also right, of course. I mean, that it's uh, it's it's a self-run uh, <laughs> organization or kind of self-administered. Thing and in that sense, it, it so uh, it's more like governmentality. Hmm? Governmentality, it's more like a self regulation. But it has, of course, I mean, deep political mm -hmm. implications too for the, the, the kind of world. Uh. So, but if you're talking about um, okay, aesthetics, you are you were saying you you want to have other aesthetics. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Having another language. <laughs> So it's probably a, a, a Ghanaian or a Nigerian movie starting <laughs> on, <laughs> on Birgit's phone. <laughs> but, uh, on her so phone? Uh, uh, <laughs> what's the question? What did, um, you, what did you ask? <laughs> go on. <laughs> no, you said something about No, no, you're, you're talking all the time about um, having another language, you know. But... Um, uh, yeah, because I, I think, for example, uh, what I'm working on now in the city, mm. the city life. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, it also, uh, yesterday I, I mentioned infrastructure. If you look at the infrastructure, that infrastructure or, or urban planning has, of course, deep political implications. It's about, it's about uh, the whole, it's about geographies of inclusion, exclusion, who has a right to the city, word, right, that whole discourse. And and I think, but very often also the the the, the actual existence and livelihood set of of people just on on a very I mean common daily level mm. remain unseen. It's it's as if uh, they, they they're put in a black box, and we call that black box the city or the slum or whatever, and that that covers it. And a lot of things go on so uh, in 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 that black box, and uh, and 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 you need to you you need tools. Uh, an ethnographic imagination, a, a language, a discourse to to cover that and to unwrap that and to to un to open it up somehow, and I yeah. and if you think of that urban life in in the shadow as as it were, I mean to 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 refer to Jim Ferguson's uh, book on uh, the, the neoliberal world order and and the shadows of that, and the kind of urban world that I work in is certainly in the shadow of, of that, that global world. It, it remains unseen, uh, mm -hmm. even though Kinshasa is a huge city. It's 10, 11, 12 million, nobody knows. But it's not one of the world's major hubs in, 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 in the kind of Saskia Sassen type of, of, of city world. Uh, no, yeah, city and so, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in, uh, in what is in the shadow and how can we illuminate the shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the work by William Kentridge? Mm -hmm. um, I know it. I am fantastic. South African artist, and and uh, and uh, I don't know whether you ever saw Black Box, the, the that that thing. The, it's a whole installation. It's like a puppet theater mm -hmm. with with shadow puppets, um, and it's on the Herero genocide. So it's mm -hmm. it's a deeply emotional mm -hmm. piece, also about yeah loss, about mourning, about death, about about exploitation, colonialism, and so on. Uh, but but the way in which he uses shadow and, 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 and turns light on the shadow to illuminate it, and he always starts, of course, and he's written about it. Uh, recently he gave it in, in, in Yale a whole series of lectures that you can download from YouTube. Uh, and it, it's a, a whole theory of shadow, and he starts with Plato, of course, in the cave. And, and, uh, but so there's something about about the shadow it's not an it's not empty it's 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 it is filled with content and and it's good to think with it, it because it tells us something about dimensionality about how realities that we perceive are actually not what we perceive but they they shape shift into something else and so on and that's what i'm interested in how what, what we see is not what we see how how there's something 
uh, and I'm not necessarily talking about an occult reality, mm. or but just simple things, daily activities and so on that go unperceived. And I, I find it my job to to dig them up, as it were, or to 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 capture them. And and uh, and I don't have to do that alone. I can do it with Sammy, or I can do it with other people, uh, whether they're Congolese or Belgian, or it doesn't matter, or local artists or whatever, or just other other people. And it becomes a it it, it, it becomes a, a, a journey of discovery together, and it becomes it's about it's about encounter, and so in that respect, uh, you know whether it's in Congo or in Brussels, or it doesn't really matter either. Uh, you, you you could do that everywhere. Uh, did, you do, did you do research in, in Brussels? Sorry. Did you also do research in Brussels? No, no I, not I did that for after my retirement. <laughs> 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 So, but, uh, yeah. What else can I say about it? Uh <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it was just, um, I find it interesting. I know. Yeah. Um, and, then and then it's about, and it's about rhythm in a way. Uh, it's, ab I mean, that language, to discover that language, to, to create that language, it's about well not, only s not only scales where you put yourself to... Uh, to 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 capture it uh, mm. in the middle ground from above from below whatever, but it's also about specific rhythms and and how d and and then the whole question becomes and I think that's uh, just methodologically that's a very important one how do you uh, yeah, how do you rhythm a narrative how do you build a narrative and uh, for example between text and photograph or in a film how do you constitute uh, what makes a film work as a narrative. Well, this is a normal question for every narrative. Sorry? It's yeah, but it's, it's kind of, yeah. Yeah, okay, normal mm -hmm. question, but then it involves, uh, it's, it's only in, in doing it that you, I, I don't have uh, I mean, uh, much to say about it, but uh, making a film, for example, really made me think hard about which image you put in, what does it convey, because one image can be read in all kinds of ways. Uh, for example, in that cemetery, I, I deal with the, the main protagonists are grave diggers, mm -hmm. uh, and they sit they every morning. They go to the, the the cemetery and they wait for basically bodies to arrive that they can bury. And so there's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of dead time, uh, and so they hang in a tree and they take they take a little nap there and so on. If you show that image, yeah, an African guy in a tree, uh, you can read it in all kinds of ways. Uh, um, and and so it it you can read in a, a politically totally non correct way and so when you put that in what do you convey and so having to work with images made me think much harder than because it also has a lot more impact than words and and uh, so and you reach out to other audiences that are not necessarily come with with the theoretical equipment to 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 deconstruct it and so on so it it has an immediate impact mm -hmm. and and so it, you have to think hard about why it is you put it in there, or, uh, and, and what it is it has to tell and to do. And, uh, but it's a kind of work that I find fascinating too, uh, because it, it actually touches on, on the, the, the colonizing and decolonizing issues too. Uh, um, who is speaking for whom, and, 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 and who is a speaking position, and, and what do you do with it, and what kind of responsibility does it, does it give you? Uh, but in that case, you are speaking for who? Are you are you the speaker for someone else, or what would you say? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I'm, I don't think so. Or no. Maybe it can turn into a conversation, mm -hmm. like uh, I, 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 I have a conversation with Sammy uh, uh, at the moment, and and uh, but it's it's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That but what are you all doing kinds of things, But, but uh, uh, and then. But that's that's already too abstract. That's again about I mean, uh, audience. Uh, I certainly think that some people read my text, and that at some level maybe it, it might produce ripples in the water, or it, it might have an impact. But okay, uh, but uh, but that's not what makes me write. Uh, mm. But you were saying in the morning, you were saying we need new formats, you know, you're kind of like we are kind of in the prison of scientific rules and orders we are following, which is also kind of a colonizing act. What? Science? No, yes, science is that we are kind of, we are remaining in this kind of order in the science, how we have to put the results to the audience. And But that academic framework is very restrictive, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's it's great time. 
and you, we, we've not been very imaginative with, with uh, how we try to translate or represent the worlds that we live with and, and talk about and so on. We're actually being uh, we, we've, uh, very conventional. Of course, there's the whole writing culture thing and in the 19th. But it didn't take us very far. There are far more imaginative ways to, to deal with all kinds of realities. Uh, and, and we haven't gone a long way. And of course, I mean, working within an academic structure, uh, uh, you're bound to, to a certain type of production and, and so on. Um, I'm and, and I think, well, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a professor. And so if I can't do what it is I want to do, who can? I, I, I don't need an appointment anymore or so. Uh, and, and so I, I, I want to take advantage of that, of that freedom in a way, even though... Uh, and the university in the end always follows. In the, in the beginning you say, well, but this is not academic or this is not serious. And then uh, uh, when you make an exhibition or a film and, and then it wins a prize and then they're the first to say, oh, uh, you know, one of ours uh, won a prize and then, and then it becomes all of a sudden important. So you can turn it around to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, yeah, there is something very restrictive about that academic uh, framework. But on the other hand, you can, you can try to break it open, I think, much more than we do. Uh, I think we've, I mean in terms of activism, that's where my activism would be, mm. uh, to, 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 to try to, to, to open up new grounds. To uh, No, I think this is a good point. I think you're right. We are really remaining in kind of orders, how we have to present and to who we are presenting. And I think if you're talking about decolonizing or democratizing knowledge, I think uh, it still remains too much in kind of, well, of course, here we are in a cultural setting, but still it's too much in the scientific or in this kind of cultural institution that it doesn't go out really. Mm. I don't know how, what's the view work you film? It was shown in several festivals, I think. Or um, was it more like in the ethno ethno Of course, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a filmmaker either. So uh, you know, let's be modest. And it was actually quite hard to get into that circuit. Uh, much to my surprise, it it uh, it, it didn't have a, a big life uh, uh, outside of uh, certain certain circuits. So in, in that sense, it, it was a bit of a disappointment. Also, I decided that probably it's not my medium. Uh, Why? Well, it's 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 difficult to narrate something. Um, I th I think very much um, words give you a lot of freedom, uh, and and you can you can you're your own master, and you can you can order them the way you want uh, in in a way. Whereas filmmaking is of course a, a collective thing. And I found it very hard. It was a long struggle to keep in control of the thing. Uh, there's a lot of people pulling back and forth, and uh, and so yeah, and it's it's another medium. It's not mine. Yeah.